Good morning. Welcome to St. John as we gather together on this fifth Sunday in Lent. Uh, just a reminder that our, our last Wednesday midweek service will be this Wednesday uh, at 6.30 in the dwelling place, meal from 5 to 6, and then service at 6.30. Also a reminder, as this, is the, as this is the end of the spring break week, there is no Sunday school uh, after the service today. Um, also, just with respect to the order of service, we are, now that it's a new month, we are in divine service setting three. Uh, if you want to follow along in the hymnal, that's page 184, uh, or just use your bulletin. So we begin with our first hymn this morning, 425, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, 425. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave me and forgave my sins. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you 
and justly deserves your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in this stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday in Lent is from Isaiah chapter 43. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness 
and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give them water in the wilderness, rivers in the wilderness, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Philippians chapter 3. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord.
invite you to stand as we honor the words of Christ in the Holy Gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 20th chapter. Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went away into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they could, would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against them. But they feared the people, so they watched him and sent spies, who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said so as to, to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day, 565.
Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Two questions. I have two questions for you to ponder today. The first, what do you place your confidence in? And the second, why does God love you? In what do you place your confidence in? Why does God love you? Two pretty simple questions, but our answers can reveal a lot. We'll return to these questions in a bit, but first let's turn to our text from Philippians chapter 3. So St. Paul had an impressive resume. We see some of it in our text. An Israelite, circumcised on the eighth day, a Hebrew from the tribe of Benjamin, trained as a Pharisee in God's law, a zealous persecutor of the church, and blameless in living according to the law. Pretty impressive. Some of it isn't good, like the whole bit about persecuting the church, but even that he did very passionately. Even so, Paul lists here several impressive credentials and qualifications. However, within the context of his letter to the Philippians, he's downplaying his own resume. In fact, he considers it to be loss and rubbish. So why is he even mentioning it? Why is he mentioning his resume here? Well, the thing is, most of Paul's resume is, in and of itself, a good thing. Yes, the bit about persecuting the church was bad, but the rest of his resume was actually full of good things. That he was circumcised on the eighth day marked him as belonging to Israel, God's chosen people. This shows that he belonged to a godly family. His lineage as a Hebrew from the tribe of Benjamin was also a good thing. One's heritage and belonging to a specific community bound by blood and faith can be wonderful gifts. And Paul had been trained as a Pharisee. Acts 22 records that Paul received his Pharisaical training from the prestigious Gamaliel. Now we tend to give the Pharisees a bad rap because of their antagonism towards Jesus. But if we take a step back from that, the Pharisees were, at their core, pious and devout Jews who sincerely cared about their faith in Yahweh. They were theologically trained scholars, and Paul had received this theological training. And theological education is also a good gift. Paul also mentions his zeal for persecuting the church, which, of course, was bad. But to have zeal can be a good thing if directed toward the right thing. And finally, Paul states that he was blameless in following the law. Now, he certainly didn't keep the law perfectly, but he took it seriously. And striving to live according to God's law is a good thing. So again, Paul's resume in itself was, for the most part, full of good things. Having a heritage and belonging to a faith community, having an advanced theological education, and zealously living according to God's law are all good things to be treasured. Paul's resume is pretty impressive. Paul even acknowledges as much in verse 4. He says, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Paul could place quite a bit of confidence in himself and his accomplishments. Yet there was obviously a problem. Paul's confidence was misplaced. For really to place confidence in something is really to place one's faith in something. Paul had turned the good things of his resume into ultimate things. That is, he had turned them into idols. Instead of placing his confidence in God, he placed his confidence in his heritage, education, skills, personality, and ambition. Paul's resume, as good as it was, had been twisted into things that became destructive. Paul's idolatry, his confidence in himself, led him to destroy the church, and unbeknownst to him, his relationship with God. His false confidence resulted in destructive behaviors. This is what happens with idolatry. Often the things we idolize are in and of themselves good gifts from God. Career, family, leisure, education, sex, property, etc. These are all great gifts from God. But when they turn into idols, 
They're no longer the gifts that God intends them to be. Idolatry always has fallout. Idolatry damages our relationship to the object that we're idolizing. It damages our relationships with others, and it damages our relationship with God. Idolatry has many consequences, and truthfully, all sin is a form of idolatry. Every sin ultimately breaks the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. God doesn't want to share our worship with any other thing. He doesn't want us to fear, love, and trust in anything else above him. And so through faith in Christ and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, God is constantly removing the idols in our hearts. He wants us to place our confidence solely in Christ and nothing else. God is in the business of idol removal. And this idol removal is an ongoing process throughout our entire lives. Sometimes it's slow and gradual. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes God gently crushes our idols. Sometimes he's not so gentle. However God does it, it's ultimately for our good. He crushes our idols for our sake. It's better for us and for those around us when we worship the Lord our God alone, placing our fear, love, and trust in him above all else. God will have us place our confidence in Christ alone. And he works to remove the false confidence that we place in anything other than Christ. And this is what happened to Paul. He had such a high confidence in his resume, and at the height of his confidence, on the road to Damascus, Paul met Jesus. Paul's self-confidence led him to hearing those terrible words from Christ. Paul, why are you persecuting me? On that road in his conversion to faith in Christ, God stripped Paul of the confidence he placed in his resume. This event is what Paul's sharing with the Philippians, his experience of God's idol removal. And so he proclaims, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. God stripped away his false confidence and replaced it with confidence in Christ. And Paul shared his resume with the Philippians not to boast or brag, but to show that he considered it all to be lost. And he sarcastically states that he's very qualified and credentialed, but now he refuses to place any confidence in his qualifications or credentials. When compared to Christ, it's all loss. It's all rubbish. But in his loss of everything in which he used to place his confidence, he's gained something far better. He's gained Christ. And now, as he says in verse 10, he seeks to know Jesus all the more in the power of his resurrection. And throughout his life and ministry, Paul would learn of again and again and again Christ and the power of his resurrection. For time and again, Paul would be forced to place his confidence not in himself, but solely in Christ. Whenever he would experience loss, he would gain Christ. Through the thorn in his flesh, through the multiple beatings, through the many imprisonments, through the countless other hardships that he experienced, he would learn to place his confidence only in Jesus. And in doing so, he would know, in part, Christ and the power of his resurrection. Where he was weak, there Christ was strong. Christ was his only confidence, and Christ was with him in the hardships and loss. So returning to my first question, what do we place our confidence in? Well, our immediate answer should be Christ. But by our actions and behaviors, we often reveal that we place our confidence in anything but Christ. We each have our own personal resumes, filled with good gifts, skills, and accomplishments. I've been Lutheran my whole life. I've been a member at this church for so many years. I have this degree or job, family, ministry, house, skill, ability, and so on. 
Whatever its content, we all have resumes filled with credentials and qualifications. And these can be very good things, good gifts from God. But do we place our ultimate confidence in these things? Even though we do believe in Christ, we so often and easily begin to place our confidence in these other things. Even though we believe in Christ, we often drift towards placing confidence in that which is not Christ. Our thoughts, words, and actions reveal this. When we use our resumes to prop ourselves up, when we use God's good gifts for selfish gain, and when we use our credentials and qualifications to belittle others, we're misusing God's gifts by placing our ultimate confidence in them rather than the one who bestows the gifts. And often, when we place our confidence in such things instead of Christ, a consequence of such idolatry is an attitude of entitlement. I deserve fill in the blank because I am fill in the blank. This belongs to me because of my position. I should get things my way because of my status. Such an attitude of entitlement is not God-pleasing. This is what Paul's teaching against in Philippians 3. For here and throughout the scriptures, God speaks against such prideful entitlement. It's the antithesis to the humility that we see in Jesus. And really, an attitude of entitlement has no place in the church. An attitude of entitlement really has no place in the lives of Christians. None. We all have our personal resumes filled with God's wonderful gifts, but when those resumes are used for personal gain, selfish interests, exploiting others, or with an entitled attitude, those gifts lose the purpose for which God gave them. We, like Paul, should keep our personal resumes in their proper place. That is, because we know Christ, because we have gained Christ, we should consider them loss and rubbish. For underlying such an attitude of entitlement is the thought or feeling that God loves me because of this thing I have in my resume. And so we come to the second question that I ask. Why does God love you? For often when we place our confidence in something other than Christ, we begin to believe that God loves us because of that thing. God loves me because of blank. Paul believed God loved him because of his impressive qualifications and credentials. But that wasn't true. And God stripped away the false confidence he had in those things. Jesus revealed God's love for Paul as pure grace, completely undeserved, yet completely given love. Paul did not and could not earn God's love. In standing before the love of God, Paul's resume was complete loss. It was all rubbish. And so it is with us. God most assuredly loves you. But God doesn't love you because of the, any of the things in your resume. He doesn't love you because you've been a Lutheran your whole life or come from a family that's been Lutheran for generations. God doesn't love you for your ability to love and serve others. God doesn't love you because of your education, theological knowledge, skills and abilities or your job. He doesn't love you because you give X amount of dollars to charity or you do your best to live a moral life. He doesn't love you because you've been a member at St. John for so many years. He doesn't love you for your passion for ministry or because you're a called church worker. These are, of course, good things, good gifts from God. But God doesn't love you for any of these things or anything else that might belong to your resume. God loves you solely because he is a gracious, merciful, and loving God. He loves you on account of Christ and what he's done for you through his death and resurrection. By this we know love, that Christ laid down his life for us. God doesn't love you because of you. God loves you because of him. The newsboys have a song that states, He doesn't love us because of who we are. He only loves us because of who He is. 
God graciously loves you regardless of what is or isn't on your resume. And because God loves you, because he's given you the gift of faith, you have truly gained Christ. Your confidence solely is solely in Jesus. And with this gain, Christ will make himself and the power of his resurrection known to you. In closing, I'd like to return to Paul's resume one more time. Even though it became for him loss and rubbish upon his conversion to Christ, that doesn't mean Paul never again used any of it. In light of gaining Christ, the content of his resume was put back in its proper place, therefore allowing Paul to use those gifts and skills appropriately. Instead of using his credentials and qualifications for selfish gain, they were now used in service to others. Paul continued to be a Hebrew of Hebrews, but instead of something in which he placed his confidence, Paul leveraged his heritage to minister to his fellow Jews. The theological training that Paul received as a Pharisee certainly was not discarded, but now it was all seen through Christ. And Paul used his theological knowledge to preach and spread the gospel. His theological education became centered in Christ and is, it is revealed on every page of his New Testament letters. And Paul's zeal in persecuting the church was transformed into a zeal for growing the church by spreading the gospel of Jesus. While Paul's resume became rubbish as something in which to place his confidence, by placing his confidence in Christ, it was then used appropriately for the sake of Christ and in service to others. And the same is certainly true for us. Christ transforms our resumes to be in service for the sake of others. We no longer need to place our confidence in our own credentials or qualifications. Instead, Christ frees us to use those good gifts to serve our neighbors. Because of God's love for us, we can view our personal, personal resumes differently, in a new way. We view them in light of Christ, the one that we have gained, the one in whom we place all of our confidence. Christ has made you his own. Keep pressing on to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Amen. Now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We continue by singing the offertory. Please stand. Again, good morning and welcome uh, as we join together in our Father's house. Um, at this time, our service continues as we gather our tithes and offerings. And please fill out the card in the pew in front of you, let us knowing you're, letting us know you're here in worship this morning.
Please stand as we join together for the prayer of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O oh Lord, deliver us from contending or even pretending that we are righteous before you because of who we are or what we have done. We confess that we are sinners who only deserve your wrath. So cause us to turn from our worthlessness and hold fast to the surpa surpassing worth of Christ Jesus and his righteousness given to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you gave your Son to be rejected by sinners, that we sinners might be welcomed into your kingdom. We pray that you would preserve and enlarge your church and this life won for us in Christ and by Christ, the crucified and risen one. Give us faithfulness to the preaching of your word and the administration of your sacraments, and let us, your people, receive these gifts with both penitence and faith. We pray that you would bless those missionaries who serve around the world. This week we pray for uh, the Lutheran Association of Missionary Pilots, or LAMP, uh, who serve in Canada, as well as those pastors who are educated in Africa. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our Lord, we confess that salvation belongs to you alone and pray that your blessing be on your people. Endow parents with every good gift to teach their children your ways that they might live in the confidence of your grace and your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, O oh Lord, you shield us and lift our heads. We pray that you would give us civil authorities who discourage evil and encourage good and keep us ever mindful that our hope is in you. We pray for those around the world who are impacted by war and injustice, that you would give peace and justice. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray and lift up before your throne of grace all those who have any kind of need. We pray for Arlene, for Paul Johnson who recovers from surgery, for Larry. We pray that you would give peace and hope and comfort that comes in and through the Good Shepherd as we lift up um, the family of Kurt Milkey, who is asleep in Jesus, whose funeral will be this week. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, St. Paul counted all things as rubbish in order that he might gain Christ. So give us repentance hearts that we would abandon all confidence in our flesh and in doing so receive your son's body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you that as we join not only with angels and archangels, but all the company of heaven in remembering those saints who have gone before who now rest from their labors. And this week we remember Pastor Parker Knoll, who is with Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in baptism you shared Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection with us, that we might be raised from the dead. Preserve us from taking his sacrifice for us for granted. Encourage us to forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead until we attain the resurrection from the dead. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue now with the service of the sacrament with the preface. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. <laughs>
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
This eating and drinking of Christ's body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in both body and soul until life everlasting. Depart in the peace of Christ. Amen. give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.